my question. Um, I have a question about how uh, some people believe in the annihilationist view of hell and others believe in the traditionalist way. And I'm a traditionalist myself, but someone who believes in the annihilationist view asked me something about how, you know, how in Isaiah 34 verse 10 it says that the smoke will rise forever from generation to generation. This is talking about like the judgment of the people of Edom. Mm-hmm. And they asked me, how is it that um, that imagery can't apply to the New Testament when the New right. Testament authors are writing about hell. Yep. Yeah. L- let me. Let me. Uh, I'm not sure what I just did to my watch, but stop that. Okay. Good. Um, in, in ten minutes, I, I have to be uh, somewhat brief. Um, okay. But let me just uh, uh, put it this way: um, they're right. And 99% of the ministers that I minister with regularly, I would say, have never seriously engaged the arguments of the annihilationists, or they're also called the conditionalists. Um, vast majority of people believe what they believe in the subject by tradition. Uh, It's what they've absorbed from the church culture and have never been challenged to seriously think through what this position is all about. And I would likewise argue, and it's the same same thing, interestingly enough, as to why most people who are Protestants reject Roman Catholic distinctives. It's not because they know or they're convicted or they've actually studied it. It's just what they've picked up. And as a result, I would argue that my synergistic Armenian friends um, don't have a real solid foundation for rejecting the best arguments of conditionalism. Um, When I talk to my fellow Christians about this and I say to them, you know, conditionalism is one of the hardest things to deal with from a biblical perspective. It's, it's, the arguments are tough. They look at me like, are you just stupid? Um, <laughs> they really do because they've never, it's, it's, it's an area where I know they're out there. It's just for some reason, no one ever listens to anything. To, they don't listen to their arguments. They don't listen to what they're saying. And maybe because I've dealt with Jehovah's witnesses and I've dealt with seventh day Adventists and I've, and I've dealt with that for a while um, maybe that's because I, maybe that's one of the reasons. And then back in, oh, well, I forget what year it was, but it was before 2010. Was it? Yeah. Probably late, late 2008, 2009. I did a program on conditionalism, annihilationism with, with two annihilationists on unbelievable, the, the webcast, the broadcast out of London, where I was actually in the U S that's first time we use an ISDN line to do the, um, uh, unbelievable program. Um, before that was before Skype and all the rest of that kind of stuff, uh, Zoom and, and things like that. So, um, I've I've had to be forced to to think this through a little bit more. Um, I don't want to be the apologist for hell, to be honest with you. And <laughs> in fact, I could wish conditionalism was true. I really could. I mean. When you think about it, it provides a, an easy answer to a lot of objections that unbelievers have. So I could wish it, I could wish that it were true. There's one major problem, and I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you for all the toilet paper in my house, <laughs> which, which hopefully within a year, no one will understand, you know, unless they're remembering back. Uh, but, you know, a year ago, can you imagine that meaning something? It, it does now. But I, I can guarantee you all the toilet paper in my house um, that within two weeks, a certain group that I know of will have a video out of what I'm saying right now, responding to it from a conditionalist perspective. I just, just guarantee, just write it down. Put it, in, put it in stone. It's going to happen. Um, anyway, uh, here's, here's the issue. Um, I could wish that it were, it were true. Um, oh, by the way, you, you need to be aware. The vast majority of New Testament scholars hold that view. 
If you if you hold that. if you hold the traditionalist perspective. Now, when I say New Testament scholars, I'm talking about Roman Catholics and, and all sorts of others too. Even that's not an official Roman Catholic perspective, but Rome doesn't care what its scholars believe anymore. Um, but um, I can name numerous conditionalists who are uh, New Testament scholars. Um, it just it's almost the default pr- perspective outside of. Uh, <sighs> There's almost a, a, a connection between it and a belief in penal substitutionary atonement. A lot of people don't accept that either. And there's almost a connection there that if you do accept penal substitutionary atonement, then it's probably going to impact your views and those things too. But here's the issue. Um, as I understand it, here's, here's the issue. It's not, can you come up with a way of interpreting eternal punishment, eternal life, parallel, Matthew 25, um, is there a difference between the imagery of Isaiah and Revelation in regards to the punishment of the beast and uh, the punishment of Edom or anything like that? Are there not greater fulfillments in, 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 in the Revelation aspect than you would have in something like that? The issue isn't that that is so clear that that's sufficient foundation for the traditional perspective. For me, the issue is soteriology and anthropology. So, when people object to the eternal punishment of the wicked, their objection is that even though they may have been very wicked, they were only wicked for a certain period of time. For a limited period of time, that, in our minds, seems completely out of proportion to eternal destruction. Because the conditional will say, Eternal destruction just simply means destruction that has eternal consequences. It's done, mm-hmm. you're gone, that's it, and you've remained that way. Um, you can argue both sides of that, because I think that limits it in a way that, that the language wouldn't necessarily indicate, but that's, that's, not here, that's not the issue right here. The idea, the, the driving force is this idea that temporal sin cannot justly require eternal punishment. Because what, what have you heard as the normal response to that? The normal response to that is, yeah, but it's, it is an infinite character that has been violated. It's God's mm. infinite character that has been violated by our sin, and therefore that warrants eternal punishment. Okay, um, that's not specifically stated in Scripture that way, but I, I think it's a it's a valid point to make, but is that really the best answer? <clears throat> and here's what I would suggest to you. Why is it that we assume that every person who dies as a rebel against God is changed into a saint when they die, including the wicked? You go, well, well we don't, but we do. Because the assumption we all make is that when we die, we stop sinning. Now, the only way you can stop sinning is if you are sanctified. The reality is, those who die in rebellion against Christ not only continue in that state upon their death and upon their discovery that they are now separated from God and under his wrath, uh, we were talking about Hades before, Um, but now the restraint that was placed upon them in this life is removed from them. And so I think this this is the key issue, because if you're going to argue, well, it's not proper to eternally punish someone, but what if they remain in in a condition of rebellion? Conditionalism, annihilationism, and it's and it, there's different forms. There's different understandings. There's a, it, it, it's a complicated area. But an evangelical, if you can use that terminology, but an evangelical conditionalism would require you to believe, as they as they express it, that you're going to be raised, judged, and punished commensurately with your sins at the end of your punishment. So there is there is punishment. It's not just, poof, disappear. It's not like the Jehovah's Witnesses. There is an end to that punishment, and then the, at the end, you, you are annihilated. You, you, you cease to exist. What's the assumption of all that? 
that you're not sinning any longer against God, that, that you are in submission to this, you're in submission to the punishment, that you're not continuing your hatred, or that hatred of God after death is not considered to be something that requires punishment, which I think would remove from you the Imago Dei. As long as something which made in the image of God continues to hate God, that is, a, that is something that's going to bring separation. So I do think that the vast majority of thought as to what hell is, what it's going to look like, is complete bogus absurdity that you can mm -hmm. never demonstrate from Scripture. Um, devils running around with pitchforks. What? That's Dante. That's not Bible. Uh, we're going to be having a big party down there. You know, Gary Larson, the far side with all his stuff about hell. Nope. Ain't going to be happening. As far as I can tell, the imagery that's used, you're alone. You're alone. But now that the restraints have been removed from you, your hatred of God becomes self-consuming. I don't think God has to extend any energy whatsoever to torment anyone in hell. If you are consumed with your hatred of God and you are now separated from everyone else and anything that reflects the image of God, what's the only thing left? Yourself. You are the only yeah. reminder of it. That will be enough punishment. God doesn't have to be doing anything. So, yeah. Yeah. so the question, so the only question is, really, is, is it, it does the, does the light of the cross and the empty tomb tell us that God can suspend at some point the punishment of that continuing rebellion and just simply take that person out of existence? Now, let me just ask you, uh, Charles, have you ever heard anyone even raise the questions that I just raised? No. That's the problem. That's, yeah. that's the problem right there. So what I'm, um, what I'm, so what I'm telling you is I respect, yeah. I respect the conditionalists. They, they, they are, their arguments are far better than our side is willing to admit because we don't listen to them. And I've said, yeah. I, I wish they were right. I'm convinced they're not, but I wish they were right because it would simplify a lot of stuff. But what I would like things to be and the way things are are two different things. Is that helpful yeah, at all? Exactly. Very helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. White. Okay. Thanks. And uh, Thank good luck out there in New York. <laughs> I don't really believe in luck, but no anyways. Bless. No bless. <laughs> God bless. We'll see you later. Bye bye. All right. Well, that'll, I guarantee you, I could name names within two weeks. YouTube, I'll find it. I'll find it. What? Did you, do you want to say something? Jump into what? Into that conversation. Oh, well, I didn't notice that. I'm looking Just, at the camera. Yes, of course you are. The first time I ever encountered this, I'm, I'm going to go into the Wayback Machine. 32 years ago, you are teaching LSW2A, if I recall, maybe B. You are, we are at North Phoenix Baptist Church. LSW? Oh, singles? Yes. We are, te we are, I'm in the singles group, you're teaching one of the other singles group, and I have two guys here show up in my singles group, and they hijack the class and start talking about Matthew 25, 46, right. and how we have no way of knowing what Ionios means. Right. I remember that. And I, as soon as class is over, I walk across the hallway, I grab you and drag you into the hallway, and introduce you to these two guys, because they think they're about to take over the whole church. And next thing you know, you start explaining to them, Ionios is in both places. It's eternal punishment and yeah. eternal life. So exactly which one do we not understand? Because you're fine with the life part. You're not fine with the punishment part. And it's Yeah, like, that was their big thing. They, yeah. I, I, would not, I would not consider them to be, to have been the best proponents of that perspective let's just put it that way but, but yeah your point about the fact that we don't encounter this that was a perfect example of it because the entire group of people in that classroom which was a number of people that could populate many reformed baptist churches okay n numbers wise were stumped oh, these yeah. guys had that you could hear a pin drop on the carpet in that room and 
they had him stumped. So yeah, there there might be some developments in that area in the future. Um, but I'm not get, not going to get into it right now. But um, 